Welcome to another video from ExplainingComputers.com. This time it's a somewhat different kind of episode as I'm going to debunk seven common computing urban myths. These are things I often see written in comments on this channel and I go in and leave a reply that says, no, that isn't true. And so in this video, I'm going to try and bring some clarity to the situation and I do know we now live in a world where fact and opinion are completely intermingled. I can't fix that in one video. I might be mad to try and even try and fix it in the context of computing, but I'm going to have a go. And I think we should start with what has to be the most common computing urban myth of the past decade. Since May 2015, there's been an urban myth that Microsoft said that Windows 10 would be the last version of Windows. And yet, they never ever said this. Rather, what happened was that at the 2015 Microsoft Ignite event, a developer called Jerry Nixon was talking about how, when they were launching Windows 8.1, they were already working on Windows 10. And he went on to say that right now we're releasing Windows 10, and because Windows 10 is the last version of Windows, we're all still working on Windows 10, and it's really brilliant. So, in other words, Jerry was referring to Windows 10 being the last version of Windows they had created and that developers were working on. Not that Windows 10 would be the last version ever. But tech journalists chose to take the middle of a sentence completely out of context to use as clickbait, and so the urban myth was born. And if you want to check on this, there's a recording online, and I'll include the link in the video description. So, to be clear, Microsoft never put out a statement that Windows 10 was going to be the last version of Windows. And indeed, a Microsoft spokesperson even gave a statement to The Verge where they said that recent comments at Ignite about Windows 10 are reflective of the way Windows will be delivered as a service, bringing new innovations and updates in an ongoing manner with continuous value for our consumer and business customers. We aren't speaking to future branding at this time. However, even though this statement explicitly referred to future branding, or in other words, the name for the next version of Windows, The Verge and others completely misinterpreted this statement. And so, understandably, Microsoft gave up trying to correct the lies that journalists continued to publish. Right, let's move on to our second urban myth, which is that M.2 is an interface. However, the M.2 slots into which we plug SSDs and other peripherals are just a physical connector that can support many different interfaces. These include a PCIe interface, which is commonly used to communicate with NVMe SSDs, as well as a SATA interface or a USB 2 or USB 3 interface. Because of this, it's not true to say that, for example, an M.2 SSD will always be faster than a 2.5 inch SSD, as it depends on the particular interface that each device uses. It may be that the M.2 drive has got an NVMe PCIe interface, and that the 2.5 inch drive has a SATA interface, and here the M.2 drive would indeed be faster. However, it could also be that the M.2 drive has a SATA interface, and the 2.5 inch drive has a U.2 PCIe interface, in which case here, the 2.5 inch drive would be the faster model. What all of this means in practice is that if you're buying an SSD or other device to plug into an M.2 slot, you must read the specification very carefully and make sure you're buying a piece of hardware with the right interface. And if you want more information, just check out my video explaining SSDs form factors, interfaces, and technologies. Next, we come to the most understandably confusing myth on our list, which is that USB-C is an interface. However, just like an M.2 slot, USB-C is simply a type of connector, technically known as a USB Type-C connector, that can carry many different versions of the USB interface protocol. 
And this means that data transmission over a USB-C connector is not necessarily faster than data transmission over a USB-A connector or even micro USB. As we can see in this table, USB interface standards and the different connectors that can carry them are very confusing indeed. And it is true that the very fastest USB interfaces can only use a USB Type-C connector. But back in the real world, today many computers have USB Type-A connectors that can communicate data at the same speed as most current USB Type-C ports. And most peripherals will communicate data no faster via USB Type-C port than over any other kind of USB connector. Again, this matters because some people do appear to judge hardware depending on whether or not it's got a USB-C port. For example, when I reviewed this tablet, there were comments that it must be rubbish because it interfaced via micro USB. And this completely misses the point that even if a tablet, mouse or keyboard has a USB Type-C connector, it will still communicate data over, at most, a USB 2.0 interface, as this is all that such peripherals require. It's also important to note that different USB-C ports have got different specifications for outputting or receiving power, and that some can also carry digital video. And so, as with M.2, be careful not to judge the interface by the connector. And if you want more information, just look to my video explaining USB from 1.0 to USB 4 version 2. Greetings! Let's move on to something that many people have complained about in the comments on this channel over the years, which is that if you write a Linux ISO file to a USB drive, it destroys the drive or reduces its capacity. And this isn't true, although what does happen is, if you write a Linux operating system to a USB drive, or indeed to a microSD card to use on a single board computer, you end up with lots of Linux partitions on the drive, and if you then put the drive into a Windows computer, it cannot read the Linux formatting, and it can't straightforwardly anyway reformat the drive at full capacity because Windows isn't designed to work with multiple partitions on a USB drive or a micro SD card. And to show what we're talking about, let's take this very USB drive and plug it into the computer we've got here. There we go. And the drive has appeared on the system. We can see it down there. We could eject it, but it is not appearing in this PC. However, we can fix this and return our drive to factory state using a utility called Dispart. And to do this, I'm going to go down to search and type Dispart like that, and then run the Dispart command and confirm to Windows we want to do it. And it is important to stress that you need to be very careful when using Dispart. You can do a great deal of damage. But that noted, let's first of all type list and disk like that to see the disks on the system. The first two disks here are SSDs, but the third one here, disk 2, is our USB drive. I know it's 32 gigabytes, so that looks about right. And so I'm now going to type select disk 2 like that. Disk 2 is now the selected disk. And I'm again going to type list disk like that, because we can now see we've got a little asterisk against disk 2. We know we've selected our USB drive. And having done that, I can now type clean like that and the drive has been cleaned, or in other words, it's been returned to factory state, and so I'll now exit from this part. But you cry, the drive still hasn't appeared in this PC. It hasn't because it hasn't been set up yet. And so we need to go to this PC, right click and click on manage, like that, and then go down to disk management. There we are, and if we scroll down, we can see disk two, there it is, unallocated. So we just do a new simple volume like that, and like that, and like that, and like that. We'll stick with the defaults for this demo and finish. And there we are, our disk is now fully restored. We had got on it a Linux distro, but now it's a fully functional USB drive in Windows. Earlier this year, I made a video about Google Docs. 
and in the comments, several people stated the common urban myth that Google reads Google Docs and that therefore Google Docs is not safe or private. However, I am as certain as any outsider can be that Google does not read Google Docs and I believe this for three reasons. Firstly, I have done some tests. I've been using Google Docs for a very long time, back to about, I think, 2010. And at the time, I was teaching a number of courses about cloud computing and demonstrating Google Docs in those courses with a colleague of mine, a very good friend of mine. And we did a lot of tests. We created some test Google accounts. And for example, we sent messages to each other using Gmail, saying things like, do you want to go to the Bahamas? I heard the Bahamas is nice. Isn't the Bahamas great? And we started to see adverts for holidays in the Bahamas coming up you know, when we were on online. It was very clear that Google was reading Gmail messages. And we did the same thing with Google Docs, writing about particular subjects, and nothing ever happened. It didn't change what, what we saw online when we put things in Google Docs. So we were pretty certain that online Gmail, Google was not reading Google Docs. The second reason I'm certain that Google doesn't read Google Docs is that it's explicit that it doesn't. For example, if we look to this web page here, Google notes that we don't use information in apps where you primarily store personal content, including Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, and Vids, for advertising purposes, period. In this context, it's also worth noting that in June 2017, Google announced in this blog post that it was also going to stop reading Gmail messages. As it stated, G Suite Gmail is already not used as an input for ads personalization, and Google has decided to follow suit this year in our free consumer Gmail service. Just to be clear, Google does scan Google Docs files to detect malware, to monitor performance and crashes, and to enable users to search their own documents. But this is not the same as reading files in a manner that would invade privacy. And the third reason I'm certain that Google doesn't read Google Docs and that Microsoft doesn't read Office 365 documents and IBM doesn't look at files on its cloud systems and things as well, is that if they did so, they wouldn't have a business. You know, cloud computing has to be private for it to be viable as a, as a commercial product. And it does bewilder me that people don't seem to get there is a very clear line between what happens when, for example, we use a search engine or a social media site where there's an explicit contract that we provide personal information for a free service and we're giving away stuff that'll influence what we see online as a result of that, there's a line between that and the provision of cloud services. And certainly, there are good reasons for using cloud-based word processing like Google Docs or Microsoft's version, whatever, and there are good reasons for not doing it. But I just hope that when people make that judgment about should they use that service or not, they do so based on the fact, not on the myth that the cloud providers actually read the documents in their systems. Back with Linux, our next urban myth is that you have to use the terminal in Linux. And whilst for many years this was true, for a good, I would say at least five years now, it has been perfectly possible to install, configure, and use a mainstream end-user-focused Linux distro, like Linux Mint or Ubuntu or Zorin OS or something like that, it's been possible to do that without going near the terminal. And I find it very sad that this urban myth that you have to use the terminal in Linux perpetuates, because it must be putting people off from using Linux. It makes people go, oh, I don't want to do that, I couldn't do that, people tell me I've got to use the terminal. You don't. And it's absolutely the case that there are certain things you can only do in Linux if you use the terminal. But as we've seen in this very video, it's also the case there are certain things you can only do in Windows using its command line. Like, for example, cleaning a drive back to factory state. You have to use the command line in Windows to do that. But the chances are most people do not need to do these types of things, either in Windows or in Linux. And so it is perfectly possible to be a Linux user and not to use the terminal. Finally, let's end with something a little bit controversial, which is the urban myth that RAID keeps your data safe. And I mention this because so often on this channel, if I build a NAS device without RAID, people go, oh, your data won't be safe if you haven't got RAID. RAID's critical to keep your data safe. And it simply isn't true. It is 
effective backups, having a proper backup strategy that keeps your data safe, and that's got nothing to do with RAID. To provide a little bit of background, RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks and stores data in each user volume across multiple physical drives. Several different RAID configurations are available, such as RAID 0, which strips data across different drives to increase access speed. However, in other configurations such as RAID 1 and RAID 10, data is mirrored on two drives so that if one of them fails, data can be restored from the other. As this hopefully makes clear, RAID protects data on a particular device from a single drive failure and usually makes it easy for the system to automatically restore data when a drive fails or needs to be replaced. This means that RAID helps to keep data continuously available. However, RAID does not protect data from user error, malware, power surges, power outages, theft, fire, flood, and other threats. Rather, this can only be achieved by using the 321 backup rule, which involves keeping at least three copies of all data on at least two different media with one copy kept off site. And under 321 backup, any data saved on a RAID NAS or server only counts as one copy. If you're running a data center, then RAID is certainly very important for maintaining uptime and allowing controlled drive replacement. But in a home environment, if you only have two drives on which to store your data, and ideally you'll have three, but if you only had two drives on which you could keep a copy of your data and you had a copy on each drive, the last place you would want both of these drives would be powered up together in the same device, subject to the same risks of user error and theft and flood and fire and power surge and all that type of thing. You'd want these drives as separated as possible. Hopefully, I have convinced you that RAID is not the means of keeping your data safe. It is for something else. But if you want proof, it was sadly provided by a YouTuber called Jerry Berg a few years ago, who had all of his data saved on a RAID system and lost all of it when the RAID system failed. And so, there we are. Hopefully, I've dispelled some computing urban myths. I bet the comments are now on fire. I will have a cup of tea before I have a look, I think, to get myself uh, built up for it. But uh, now that is it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.